it's time yet again for another anime season review. Let's go through a whole bunch of the anime coming out for winter 2019. As usual, I try to avoid sequels, seasons 2, seasons 3, seasons 4, although a few of those slipped in. And I avoid shows aimed at very young children, although I don't think there were any that um, that uh, for, for which that applied this season. Um, I'm sure I've missed a few shows, but these are all the ones I managed to catch this season. This is just based on, se on episode one, sorry, uh, episode one of each of these shows. So let's get into it, going alphabetically, and we're going to start off with Bermuda Triangle, Colorful Pastoral. I think I may have misspelled the colorful, but that's okay. This is a cute show about mermaids living underwater. Honestly, this feels like a show aimed at, like, eight-year-old girls. Uh, the mermaids all live in, like, a town underwater, like, with cobbled streets. And it's very confusing because it start, It opens in a cafe where somebody pours tea into a cup and somebody else drinks it. And the whole subplot of the first episode is around them getting cake and uh, delivering packages underwater and mail. So, obviously, the underwater thing is not really thought through physically. But it's cute. The characters are cute. Nothing really happens. Um, it appears to be just this quiet, you know, quasi-slice-of-life kind of a, a show about uh, cute girls underwater wearing pretty outfits. Um, you know... Uh, nice, pleasant, but certainly not particularly mentally challenging. In contrast to Boogie Pop and others. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this one for a second. Uh, Boogie Pop Phantom, an anime series from 2000, 2001, I believe, um, is an anime series that I recommend a lot. This is a, uh, a remake based on, or really it's, it's a, a reboot in a way. It's based on a, a light novel series. And uh, the original version was uh, kind of oddly made, very experimental. This is a more traditionally um, made work. Um, it, it's not quite as uh, artistically odd as the original Boogie Pop Phantom. Um, and this one's a little, little easier to follow, but still very complex. Um, episode one is very slow. Not much happens. It's just kind of introducing you to the basic premise of the world. And then episode two is where things really start uh, taking off, and I say that because they released both episodes one and two on the same day. So I watched both of those because it's you know it's basically a one-hour premiere. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, supernatural slash psychological thriller slash horror series. Um, people die. Um, there are strange things that happen. Again, sort of supernatural, science fictiony things, and um, it's intense. It's a little hard to follow, quite intentionally. Things happen outside of time. So if you're into that kind of thing, something very um, uh, oddball in that way, um, something that is very much intentionally so, where you're going to have to really pay attention and um, things are going to happen just out of nowhere and really surprise you, that's what you're going to get. Uh, quite impressed so far with the, the pacing and the editing, where things just happen just very quickly and uh, there are some shocking moments um, delivered in a shocking way, which, you know, good on them. So, we bought Phantom, yay. Um, moving on to Dimension High School. This is over on High Dive. A weird one. Um, it is it alternates between live action and CGI. So it's basically uh, four delinquents uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in high school in a classroom with a teacher, and then they're transported into this sort of CGI version of their classroom, sort of a sci-fi version of that classroom, and forced to solve puzzles. I think this is basically an educational program because they have to solve these like logic puzzles every episode. Um, but very goofy stuff happening, very much a, a screwball comedy, a lot of over-the-top reactions from the characters, not at all serious. And um, I found it fun and funny. I, I, I enjoyed the humor, although it is definitely that Japanese over-the-top humor, so prepare for that. Um, and it's clearly, you know, hot guys hanging out, so it's kind of that premise. Um, you know, it's a thing. What's also interesting is that the CGI appears to be all motion cap, of the performers in the room. So it's like they all got them in a green room and you know, mo them all at the same time for the, the performances. So it's, it's, it's quite a, kind of interesting how it's made. Um, so an unusual one. I don't think anyone will be you know, particularly shocked by it um, in terms of... Um, um, you know, it's, it's weird, but it's, it's in, in the, um, 
the production is different, but that's kind of the, the big deal. Uh, then there's Domestic Girlfriend. This is the, you know, the person who I thought I didn't know is actually going to be my sister slash wife slash whatever uh, show of the season. Basically, um, I do appreciate this show is more serious about it. So the main character has, um, I don't know how much to spoil about this actually. Um, suffice to say, the character has um, some complicated relationships with several female characters and then turns out they're going to be living with him. Um, pretty standard premise. Um, what I like is that they handle those relationships realistically in the sense that um, one of those relationships is one of those nah, nah, nah kind of things and like both sides re recognize that that's what that should be. So I really appreciated that aspect of, of the story that they're, they're not sensationalizing the concept too much the way so many of these stories do. So I like what they're doing with it. I'm just not, you know, it, it remains to be seen where it goes. Um, definitely high budget animation in the sense of a lot of frames of animation in there. Uh, characters seem pretty on model. Um, certainly, you know, some, some effort put into the show. So curious to see where that goes. Um, otherwise, a pretty standard artistic style for this, but definitely pleasant and definitely, you know, I like it. Moving on to Endro. So you know how the first couple of minutes of Goblin Slayer presents this kind of light, fuzzy fantasy series? That's basically what Endro is, without the dark twist. Um, although there is a twist in here. Uh, it's about a, a group of cute Moe girls in a fantasy world who all um, want to become heroes, and they're going to this... Uh, kind of hilarious, actually, like Adventurers Academy. Phil, and there's like there's a witch with like a witch's hat, and uh, you know, like a, a, a harem dancer girl type, and like like every kind of class stereotype is in their class with them, um, and uh, and they're just all gonna go and, and fight things. And then I won't spoil it, but there is a, kind of a twist around um, their their goal and what's gonna happen. It's kind of a clever twist. It's interesting to see where they're gonna go with that. Um, I always appreciate some clever writing in those things. But generally, this is a fun, light, upbeat, um, cute sea show. <coughs> Excuse me. About little girls. I told you I had a cold. Um, about, no, I say little girls. Uh, about cute girls, you know, going on an adventure together. Um, quite a decent animation budget to this um, also, actually. Although, episode one's, who, who knows where that's going to go. But I really like that. And they do a good job of making the characters... Uh, feel um, adorable and interesting. Not just adorable, but just like, oh, okay, I, I like her personality, I like her personality. People feel fairly distinctive um, over the course of the show, so good job there. We'll see where it goes, but again, definitely not a particularly challenging show. Um, moving over to The Girl in Twilight, also over on High Dive. Uh, don't let this fool you. This is a pretty serious show, actually. Um, these girls are all kind of obsessed with the idea of contacting an alternate world. So you know how isekai, the whole jumping to another world genre is very hot right now. Well, they want to do that too. So uh, they keep tuning into various frequencies on a Sony Walkman, like literally a Sony Walkman is what I recall. And um, they, um, they they keep trying to like say words that will take them to another world. And then it works. Um, and things kind of get serious. So what I liked about this is that it it appears to be dealing with this question of kind of alternate realities, and in particular, alternate versions of like yourself and of other events. So it's not just another world, it's like another timeline that they're interacting with. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I don't think, from what I've seen so far, I think this has the potential to go in interesting places. I don't think it's gonna be a, a massively complex show, which I think is gonna be good for this concept. I think that they're going to explore this from a more emotional, relational perspective than in the sense of trying to tease out every possible aspect of, of the consequences of this kind of a thing. Um, and I kind of like the idea of, of, of exploring the emotional resonance of that. So we'll see where it goes. But uh, yeah, Girl in Twilight, interesting, interesting premise. And uh, lovely character designs, a lot of uh, attention paid to lighting and, and color and such. Um, moving on to Girly Air Force. So this, this is an interesting one. Um, this clear, so it's made by the, the studio that makes Macross. And this is clearly a, an anime series where they wanted to do a, an anime series about fighter jets. And they came up with, with excuses to do that and kind of throw them away girls into fighting jets. 
Um, again, I won't spoil why all this is going on. Suffice to say, aliens are attacking, and humanity has developed these these glowy planes that they use to fight things off. It's funny how the more you get into anime, the more you recognize how uh, certain things are targeted to certain demographics. This is clearly aimed at like the hardcore military, like aircraft otaku. Uh, you know, these are specific models of planes in real world planes, and they are rendered in very loving detail. So. Uh, it's fun from that perspective. Um, the girls, so far, we've only actually met one of these in episode one, are certainly cute, but there's been very little of, of her. Um, so kind of hard to say where it's going to go because the first episode is, is pretty tied down. Is interesting for the fact that um, the protagonist of the show, um, uh, the two of the protagonists, are, is Chinese. Um, so I don't know if there is, there's some sort of you know, Chinese co-production going on with this. Um, if this is kind of made to be easily broadcastable in China, so to speak. Um, but that's kind of interesting that you have this, uh, you know, this, this Chinese connection to the show and the fact that the, the two characters are like from China and now living in Japan. So curious to see where that's going to go. Um, but as you can see, clearly you know, they, look, they look adorable. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll still have to see kind of where the whole story uh, moves. Action animation is certainly high quality. Uh, the vehicles are all obviously CGI. That's just how it is these days. But it certainly works. I was uh, not at all displeased with the art. It is the Macross Studios. So they know how to do action animation quite, quite well. So thumbs up on that one. Uh, Grimm's notes the animation. Interesting concept here. Um, it's set in a world where, in actually like a fairy tale world, uh, the main characters basically um, hop from fairy tale to fairy tale. This is all, again, stuff kind of in the back of the box premise. Um, hop from fairy tale to fairy tale, kind of fixing each one because something's gone wrong. Um, in these fairy tale worlds, everyone has a book that lays out what's going to happen to them over their lives. So they all are dealing with that, you know, you know I know that I am, you know, Red Riding Hood and I'm going to go into the woods and, you know, meet my grandmother and then I'm going to get eaten by the wolf. You know, all that stuff um, is kind of laid out for you. And... Um, but because something's wrong, those, uh, you know, those books aren't correct anymore. And they're trying to go back and correct the actual events of the world so that everything's lined up again. Um, personally, like, I could see the quality in the show. Um, I was intrigued by some of the, the plot twists in the show. Um, the first episode is very much set up, getting you used to the characters and the protagonist is kind of milk toast, so I want to see where it goes um, before I pass like real big judgment on it. But thus far, it was a little bland. Um, um, just the, the characters all felt a little archetypical, although granted that's clearly the the intent. And um, I think it's going to be one of those shows that's fun to put on, fun to watch. Probably not going to challenge you particularly deeply, but I think it'll be uh, um, a favorite for some folks. Um, it'll it'll. I, th I think it has the potential to go in interesting directions. There's just not much there to indicate whether it's going to do that or just kind of fall into the same pattern over and over. So early to tell on that. Um, but um, you can see, you know, uh, uh, nice character designs and uh, good quality animation, too. Pretty high budget there. Uh, moving on to How Clumsy You Are, Miss Ueno. This is one of those screwball comedies you're either going to love or hate. The main character, Ueno, is this somewhat hyper... Uh, somewhat, no, not somewhat hyper, extremely hyper, um, extremely emotional girl who has the hots for a guy, but of course can't, can't confess to him directly, and so keeps coming up with harebrained schemes to make him do so, because they're both parts of the, 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 or members of a science club at school. So she will come up with crazy inventions every week that will um, hopefully make him interested in her in some extraordinarily roundabout way. I found this show hilarious um, because it is so ridiculous. It is, um, you know, the, the inventions are absurd enough and her reactions are so absurd um, that it just, it kind of works for me. And the reactions of the other characters are just a lot of fun. It's an easy show, a simple show. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to get really challenged by this. Um, but it's just this, this wacky comedy kind of getting thrown at you all the time. So if you like that, that kind of style, something very, very ridiculous, 
I think you'll like this. Also moves very quickly um, in short episodes, so that might be uh, might be of interest. Um, and on a related note, we have Kaguya-sama, Love is War. Um, basic premise here is that these two characters are um, elites at their high school, um, but they're both very, very stuck up. And they are interested in each other, but they couldn't possibly confess to the other person, so they have to find figure out ways to make the other person confess to them. Uh, they don't go into over-the-top like inventions, though, like with Ueno. Um, they use simple moments in life to try to uh, trick the other person into saying something that would sound like, you know, a confession. And the person goes, oh, oh no, I'm, all, I'm almost making a confession. I gotta, a confession. I gotta think of something differently. And so it's this constant battle of wits between the two. Uh, and then also helped by the fact that there is a, um, there are other characters, of course, in between that they're interacting with that kind of trigger different things. So, and this is also a case where it is over the top in the sense of the strength of the battle. There's a lot of like death note vibes to the show in terms of the style of this just battle of wits between the two very over the top shonen stuff which i thought was uh is a lot of fun and is um and helps to make the show work also helps by the fact that the uh the style of like the characters and the situations are much more realistic much more like a uh like a shoujo romance series uh although when they're in these battle of wits it gets more like persona 5-ish if you will and so, you know, you contrast that sort of normality with this this crazy mind game that they're playing with each other, and I think it really works. It's just it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot of goofiness, um, and uh, the characters are legitimately like attractive. Like you can see why they would like each other in a way, um, even though they're both kind of horrible people. Um, so yeah, I I just find it uh, I, I I laughed a lot at Kaguya-sama. So hey, might be worth trying. Uh, moving on to Lord Elmoy the Second's case files with more on the end of it. So this turns out this is a another series in the Fate franchise, which I I am familiar with, but I have not I have not gone into Fate because reasons. Um, suffice to say, like most Fate series, if you haven't watched any Fate and you try to watch this, you're going to be lost. Um, there's just too much context to what's going on. I, I did not dislike what I saw. I was It's not that I wasn't entertained, but there's clearly a lot of context and backstory that you're supposed to appreciate about the characters and all that. And fortunately, there was someone in the chat room helping me get up to speed on some of this stuff. Um, so if you like Fate, you're going to be into this. But if not, like I, I would not start here with a Fate franchise, FYI. Uh, cool gothic horror style, though. Um, uh, like I, I really love the, the, the style of the show, but oh well. All right, uh, Magical Girl Spec Ops Asuka. So you know how Dark Magical Girls series have become kind of a thing after Madoka Magica sort of um, brought that back into the limelight uh, a while back. Uh, this is another uh, uh, series kind of in that vein, although this takes a more grounded, gritty approach where the Magical Girls are fighting a war, like a public war. People know that Magical Girls exist. They're in the newspaper. They're public figures. Um... And, um, um, again, don't know, don't know how much to, to reveal, but basically this turns into a, a story about these girls, um, and essentially PTSD, and the fact that, I should, I should say, when I say girls, they're clearly, like, older teenagers. Like, they're clearly, you know, older teenagers. So it's not 12-year-olds, but they've been through a lot in, in this fight, like, bloody stuff. This is dark, this is definitely, you know, older teen uh, uh, audience kind of stuff. And so that's kind of interesting that you have this story about girls who are um, dealing with the fact that they went through these very traumatic experiences and now they still have to do this and they're, they are willing to do so, but it's taking a, a big toll on them psychologically. And what the result of that is, is for them, and especially as they're you know, moving forward with their lives. So it's a surprisingly relevant concept uh, coming out of Magical Girl uh, especially considering you know, today with the military and how they're trained and so forth. So, curious to see where it's going to go. Um, there's definitely a moment in, in the first episode where I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I wanted that in my head. Um, so, definitely dark and, and bloody and violent at times. So, just be aware of that. Uh, but again, very, very grounded. You know, despite that, that image, 
You know, there's like there's a nurse in there, but this is not. There's really no comedy in this show so far. Jeez. So FYI, quite impressive, quite interesting. Um, moving on to also an impressive series, The Magnificent Kotobuki. Um, this is definitely one of my top tier of the season in terms of shows that I just, I feel like it was a privilege to have watched this show. Um, basically set in this slightly steampunky world, or more accurate, it's like an alternate reality, like World War II era, you know, period, but clearly not like Earth, uh, at least Earth politics and so forth. So, and it's about this uh, squadron of girls who pilot these, these ships, these, these fighter, uh, things. actually, I'm sorry, World War I instead of World War II, as you can see by the props. Um, although I guess they had props in World War II. Anyway, you, you get the idea. Sort of, you know, early 20th century uh, airplanes. And the thing is, they do this interesting thing. On the one hand, um, this is a mixed traditional character and 3D character show, meaning literally they will have hand-drawn 2D characters and CGI characters interacting in the same shot. And it works. Like, you can tell, but they put enough effort into both that you it doesn't feel awkward. And I'm not quite sure why they're doing it, because, you know, let's be honest, the hand-drawn is probably cheaper than the CGI. Um, and the CGI is done very well, by the way. It, it is It is, you know... Full scale, you know, a lot of attention paid to um, characters' expressions changing as they move. There's not that stiffness, that, that weirdness that you get from CGI characters where their mouth will, will move, but none of the, the rest of their, their face, facial expression moves as they're talking. You know, and it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, but then we get to the action sequences, and oh my gosh, the battle sequence in this first episode is gorgeous. They just spent time to make this battle scene just feel like something out of a movie. I was moved by the quality of this. It was just extremely impressive. So really love the world. Have you seen Last Exile? It has a bit of that vibe. Um, and um, just in terms of the, the world and setting, it's just it's definitely certainly more light and upbeat than that. More, you know, Moe girls in planes. Um, but there's also a little bit of darkness, a little bit of seriousness to it. Uh, you know, people do get shot down in this, uh, at least side characters do in the first episode. So, very curious to see where it goes. Um, loving the attention to detail put into it, and just really impressed, just from a technical level, at this show. And uh, definitely, I'm, I want to watch more. I definitely want to watch more. All right. Uh, then also, there's my roommate is a cat, and that's the that's the plot. That's the premise. Uh, basically, a, a shut in adopts a cat. And I did not realize this would be the one show this season that would make me, that would bring tears to my eyes, literally. Again, told you. I have a cold. So basically this guy is a kind of miserable shut-in. <laughs> He's a writer and he adopts this cat and it's about their kind of daily lives. The twist to that being that part of it is, is shown from his perspective and then, and then you see basically the same events shown from the cat's perspective with the cat narrating, whereas the guy narrated before. But there are some really um, touching moments in this. It, it really tugs at your heartstrings, much more than I thought. Um, uh, I wasn't a big fan of the character designs in this, particularly the cat, but it grew on me. Um, I think it's one of those things you just have to get used to. And I, it's just really surprisingly well-structured and surprisingly uh, thoughtfully made. I will warn you, there are some, there's a very sad moment in this that, uh, that uh, might make a few people go, whoo, you know, so be aware. Yeah, impressed. Like, this was, this was cute. Again, I'm not sure that this is a show that I'm going to, like, consume, uh, uh, you know, in, in mass quantities. I, I would like to watch more, uh, it, but it's, because it's definitely just a, a fun slice of life comedy about living with a cat, but still. Uh, let's see. Pastel Memories. This is kind of a shocker. Um, again, not sure how much to, to spoil about this. Um, it's about a group of girls living in a post-otaku Akihabara. It's basically what if the otaku phenomenon in anime and manga fandom dies down and there are almost no shops left selling this merchandise 
And so these girls are left working in this uh, in this shop, and somebody comes in and asks for something, and they have to go and find it because how do you find how do you you know um, how do you get this merchandise anymore if no one's selling it? Um, I will say there's there's the subplot of episode one is kind of this very cute and uh, um, cute commentary on what it's like being an otaku, which I kind of appreciated. And um, that said. The end of the episode reveals a a lot more about the premise of the show that's not clear from the opening. You know, it appears to be just about these girls, but there's actually a lot more going on in the, in the story. And that's that's all I'll, I'll say. Um, but just be aware that it's it's not just you know cute girls at a cafe handing out manga basically. And that was that really interested me. I think this premise might actually go in some really um, fun directions. It might, it might might just be one of these shows that's fun to watch episode by episode. Uh, to see where they go with it. Um, I'm not sure. The animation's kind of rough. Um, characters are off model fairly often. There's some stiffness and awkwardness to how they're how they move. Um, but the writing was enough there to keep me interested and that plot twist was enough to make me go, oh, hmm, okay. We'll see where they go with this. So might be worth checking out and keeping an eye on. Um, obviously one of those things where I, I, I doubt this is going to become, you know, the breakout show of the season, but it might be one of those things where where there's some really fun things coming down the road. We'll see. High Dive gets some interesting stuff, really, every season. Um, I'm always glad I check them out. Uh, moving on to The Price of Smiles. I'm having a tough time getting a, 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 a bead on this show, and I think that's intentional. Um, it has a very um, modern, serious kind of a production IG style to its its art and its character designs set in the far future on a colonized world uh, where this uh, 12-year-old girl is, has assumed the throne. Um, her, her parents have died. Um, and so she's now kind of running the country, although she's young, so whatever. Um, and then so you see the stuff around, uh, like, her bodyguard, who she's grown up with, and... Um, and then there's military stuff going on in politics. So on the one hand, it seemed to be this fluffy show about a 12-year-old girl kind of running a country, where it would be this kind of light, slight comedy with some politics woven in. Kind of like how Tenchi Moyo can do that sometimes. Um, but then the end of the episode, and again, not a spoiler, but... There's some hints at the end of the episode that it's going to get go, go in other directions. Might get dark. Not sure. And like there are Mecha. There's a whole sequence in the first episode where they're kind of training with Mecha. So I'm not sure if this is going to turn into like a gritty war story. Um, I get the feeling that you you might want to watch the first couple episodes of this show to get a feel for it before really making a decision one way or the other on it. Um, certainly a decent animation budget. Certainly. Um, a lot of attention paid to sort of backgrounds and world building and setting and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm definitely intrigued by Price of Smiles and uh, wondering where they're going to go with it because episode one is just kind of not quite clear. Um, a little more clear where they're going with The Promised Neverland. You may have heard of this show. This is almost certainly going to be one of the breakout shows of the season based on a Shonen Jump property, I believe, about a group of kids at an orphanage. Uh, who find out the orphanage is not what it seems. <sighs> Again, not going to spoil that twist. Um, I will say that this is definitely like a um, a show aimed at an older audience. There's some grotesque stuff in the show. Um, it's dark. It's very dark. Like episode one has a very dark twist in it. So you, it's very clear where it's going. Um... Uh, definitely a lot of attention paid here to... And the animation quality is is good. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's exemplary, but there's certainly plenty of attention paid to to uh, movement and such. But what really st stuck out to me were facial expressions. The show does a great job of conveying emotion in characters, especially with children. Because uh, children, you know they kind of wear their hearts on their sleeves a lot of the time. And sometimes they don't. And both of those are in, um, uh, in play here. And that's very difficult to do in an anime series where you've got... There's one kid who is clearly very guarded. 
and they just do a great job of presenting that without making him just kind of a cold fish with the only one facial expression. So I'm really intrigued where that's going to go, and that's clearly going to be an important element of the show moving forward uh, because the characters are going to have to be um, careful moving forward. So that's a really good mark. Um, also very consistent modeling all the way through. Everyone looks very consistent, which is important because they're all wearing the same uniform, and it's, it's white. So boys and girls, there's a boys uniform and a girls uniform, but it's all white, very simple. So the fact that they're, they're being very careful about how characters move and behave and you know, how they stand and so forth is, is good, uh, good sign moving forward. So I will say as somebody who has a difficult time with shows where um, children are um, uh, like in, in certain kinds of peril, um, are in, in pain, in, in various ways, and it's not like you see children being, you know, being like actively tortured for minutes in this or anything. Um, but this is clearly one of the, these shows about children in a very difficult situation. So I think for me, I'm probably gonna have to make a, take a pass on this show. Uh, just I think it's gonna be too intense for me. Um, but it's definitely gonna be, I think, a, a, an intense ride for a lot of people. So if that's up your alley, if, if that doesn't bother you, I think this is gonna be a, a, a show that folks will. Uh, be talking about for a long time to come. Uh, let's move on to something a little more of a palate cleanser. The Quintessential Quintuplets is a comedy about a, a teenage boy who is poor but an excellent student who uh, then becomes a tutor for five sisters who are all poor students and very rich. And so they all just kind of don't bother and don't do anything and they don't really care. Um, I like a comedy that has a lot to it, where it's not just like a romantic comedy between a boy and a girl, and they're basically the only two characters in the show. That gets a little old after a while. I like the fact that this show has elements of um, the boy's relationship with the different characters, and kind of how he starts off with them, where some of them like him, some of them don't. Um, none of them like, like him, like him. None of them are like outright attracted to him, but they all have kind of different, uh, different takes on him. And um, the show, that first episode, very much explains all that and explores all that. Plus, you have different aspects of personality and of where the characters are. The fact that the, 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 young, the, the protagonist is very poor, but tries not to let that, that define him. And the fact that the, uh, the sisters are very wealthy, but they, that's not really part of how they think. Um, is kind of interesting. Um, also interesting because you very rarely see anime series that deal with income disparity. Um, because this is a thing that is, A, not been a big element of Japanese society. Um, Japan has uh, long celebrated the fact that they've had this massive middle class. Um, you know, they called the 50s and the 60s the establishment of the, kind of the universal middle class for Japan. Not that everybody was middle class, but that uh, you know, they managed to make a society where a very large percentage were in this comfortable place. And um, obviously there, there are very wealthy Japanese people and poor people, um, but it doesn't get explored much in fiction. And so to see that explicitly in this show is going to be interesting, um, just to see how much they get into it. I mean, obviously I doubt this is going to be an expose on that, and Japan does not have the same problems other countries have with uh, income disparity and please I know people are going to start you know writing about this in the context of America and please do not mm, be wary of assuming that one country's you know like income disparity is comparable to another's let's just say that anyway soapbox over um, cute characters I really like the character designs um, quite a quite a high animation budget for a romantic comedy. Um, good amount of movement, um, good amount of sense of the characters being distinct and different. Um, obviously, they're they are all they are all sisters, and so they all should look you know they're quintuplets, so they should look similar, but they all look distinct enough you can tell who's who. And overall, there's clearly quality and thought put into this show. This is a show that I, where I'm, I'm intrigued to see where it's going to go, and more importantly, 
a good example of a uh, of a show that's that's firing on all cylinders. I got to the end of the first episode and I was like, they got through a lot in that episode. Like we went through a, a whole bunch of material in those twenty four minutes. So they're clearly working on this premise, and I'm 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 impressed. Um, again, not gonna be for everyone, but I think that it's a kind of a you know good job. Rainy Coco Side G. Group of cute girls. Um, there's a cafe, I think. Uh, that middle girl burst into the cafe. That's all I remember, honestly. Granted, each episode is two minutes long. Um, and I watched the first two just to get a to try to get a sense, but man, this show just left no impression on me whatsoever. Um, it's just characters interacting. I suspect this is based on something else, that I should know who these characters are. I don't know. Um, I, uh, it wasn't bad. It just, I... It, it completely... I, I don't know. What I can remember is release the spice. Again, High Dive is kicking it here uh this is an action series and by that i mean this feels like an action movie uh with basically ninja girls in a, a sort of a near future quasi dystopian you know crime riddled city uh where the girls are fighting off some you know some corruption or evil corporation or something um but the important being that important thing being that this is a high budget action series of these ninja girls just kicking ass and being ext hyper competent throughout the entire episode. One of the things that's so lovely about the the, the show is that, or at least the episode is that the girls they face setbacks, but they are just awesome all the way through the episode. Um, and um, the interesting sort of twist is about what the spice is. And if you read Dune, you have an idea. So I loved it for the consistently high frame rates, just the amount of movement. If you like animation, and especially like action animation, watch this show. Um, you know, if, if you like uh, uh, if you like action girls, you know, girls who kick tail, th this is the show for you because that's what they do um, in short skirts because, of course, and, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I found it to be just a, a joyous show. And that's one of the other things, is that it is an unabashedly action movie show. It is like Die Hard. It is just, stuff comes at you, and they're going to throw action sequences at you, and they just know what that is, and they know they're going to give it to you. Um, I just found this relentlessly entertaining, um, different enough in premise and concept to be something that um, I just, I just, gosh, I just enjoyed pretty much every minute of the show. Again, I don't think it's going to particularly challenge you intellectually, but man, you know, good job on that so far. Uh, then Rising of the Shield Hero. This is a show that's provoked some controversy over here, um, but I'm not going to address that right now. Um, suffice to say, and because there's plenty of other, other, of other folks diving into that, suffice to say, um, <clears throat> this is about, this is essentially an isekai series, you know, person transported to a fantasy world where the um, uh, things don't go well for the protagonist, shall we say. Uh, in a lot of these series, the character ends up there with, and they may be at a disadvantage, but they very quickly overcome the disadvantage, as with Reincarnated as a Slime or Remonster. Um, and some of the other isekais I've seen, the characters usually you know, very quickly level up and become powerful. Um, the character here gets put at increasing disadvantage over the course of the first episode. And these are 45-minute episodes, by the way. At least episode one is. So, <clears throat> maybe that's just the first episode. Um, so, <sighs> part of the problem is that there are two significant elements of episode one that, that I kind of cringed at. Um, and I don't know if there's enough there to sort of make me overcome that and watch more of the show. Be partly because the main character turns into sort of a, a grim fantasy hero archetype by the end of the episode. Um, he, there is character growth, which I appreciate, but where he ends up is, is a spot where I'm just not sure that I want to follow that personality 
moving forward, personally. So, curious to see where that goes. I know um, I've had at least one person uh, uh, here on the, the channel who's been following this and highly recommends it. So, um, yeah, that, is, that, is, that was my personal reaction, you know, separate from that recommendation. So, um, I, I think there's certainly stuff there. Um, just be aware that it, uh, th there's some harsh stuff in the, this early bits of, of the show. And that first episode is, it kind of drags. It, it moves fairly slowly. Um, so th there's certainly, there's certainly intent there. I should also mention the animation quality is eh, moderate. Um, yeah, there's some of the action animation is certainly, uh, uh, up there. But a lot of the conversational scenes, a lot of the other stuff is just kind of static. So, not, you know, not thrilled, certainly not bad, but it's just one of those in the middle shows for me right now. Uh, we'll, you know, uh, maybe it'll, it'll, it'll go somewhere. I'm, I'll probably give another episode or two a try, but we'll see. Um, Virtual Song Looking is a series done by a bunch of VTubers, i.e. YouTubers who use, um... Uh, CGI software to essentially with like the connect and things like that to model themselves. They basically act, but their movements are then mapped onto CGI characters and anime characters, basically that they've made up. <coughs> so the problem is, this is basically YouTube the show made by YouTubers. So the humor is very self-referential. You have these skits that don't really go anywhere. Um, it's all collaborations between different people, so you get weirdly different takes on things. And you can tell sometimes they're just not really synchronizing very well with with their concepts. Um, but they're all just, it kind of falls apart. But they all just kind of throw it all together anyway and hope that it works. Um, I suspect this is the kind of thing that will work a lot better in Japan than over here in America, just because I think more people will understand a who these people are and b what they're making fun of. Um, but I was just lost for the entire thing, frankly. It was just, it seemed like completely random uh, dialogue and completely random references. Um, I just, I couldn't get it. So, not my thing, might be yours. Definitely ridiculous screwball comedy, but also just kind of pointless weird comedy. I don't know. It's, uh, not my thing. Also not my thing, what's a 10? Story of a shy college student who likes to make cosplay and has a preteen younger sister that she likes to dress up. Okay, a little creepy, not too big of a deal. And then her little sister brings home a classmate whereupon the college student um, becomes highly enamored of the other girl and proceeds to get a squishy feeling. This term is repeated several times over the course of the episode and is the title of the episode. Um, and is constantly like um, trying to get the little this other little girl to dress up in her clothes and like offers her sweets to do so and all these various things and uh, it's just not right. Um, so understand, you know, there's gonna be somebody watching this who's never watched my videos before. I've watched a lot of anime. I'm very familiar with Japanese culture. I understand that Japanese culture is different around these things. But still, some things cross a line into creepiness, and this crossed that line, certainly for me and for the other folks I was watching this with. It just, I felt highly uncomfortable with the message they were getting across in the show that, because, mm, for lack of a better word, as far as we can tell by the end of the episode, she gets away with it. Like, the point of the episode is that if you bribe a kid with candy and cookies, then she will actually go along with you and do what you did, and you can, you can get away with it. Mm, you know, and obviously there's nothing overtly sexual in this episode. I'd say obviously. Maybe it's not obvious. Um, you know, it's, it's just getting her into these different clothes, although some of the clothes are a little fetishy. Um, I mean, fetishy as in, you know, like, uh, leotards and such. But it's just... Uh, Eh, eh, I'm sorry. It just I, I'm I'm as open minded as the next guy, but this was just no, 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 no. Finally, we have was or was or something. I don't know how to pronounce this thing, 
But boy, was I fascinated by the visuals for this. Um, it is like a sequel or spinoff of another anime series um, called Hand Holders, I think, or Hand Siders. Um, certainly set in that world. Very visually distinct. And I would highly recommend you look up this anime series, just like on YouTube or something, to get a, a sense of the visual style of it. Um, basic premise is that this, this main character, the, the, the like silver-haired boy you see here, is a DJ, and he can access this like alternate dimension um, by holding hands with somebody. And when he does that, this alternate dimension is like our real world, but with like psychedelic imagery over, you know, overlapping and texture mapping the entire world. And like there are, you know, goldfish just swimming up out of, you know, bridges and then going back down into it. And, you know, flowers going across buildings. And just really weird and interesting stuff. Very visually rich. Um, and then there's like this, there's this action scene at the end around all that. And there's obviously some conspiracy stuff going on. The tone is hard to pin down. It's... Somewhat shonen, a little seinen. It's, I would say, definitely closer to the shonen t uh, uh, camp, but uh, because it's more like a, a music anime series, um, and it's more about like a teenager finding his place in the in the real world, it seems, um, and kind of struggling with this whole idea of you know I'm, I'm you know, he wants to be a DJ and and finding popularity and all that stuff. It's I I, I was just entranced by the entire episode. Um, again, it's technically a sequel, I suppose, or spinoff, but wow, this is an interesting one and, uh, and one that just certainly caught my eye and there's enough plot, there's enough interesting elements of the story. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, Durarara or Bacano, where there's clearly a lot going on they're not explaining, but you get a good sense they will, they will explain it all by the end of the show. Um, so yeah, I am fascinated by this show and I hope it, um, I definitely want to watch more and I hope I get... Uh, a lot more out of it. Uh, I hope more is explained, and um, I I think this is going to be one of the more interesting shows of the season. We'll see. But this this it definitely is the most visually distinctive show of the season. Just wow! Again, high dive. Good job. So those are all the episode ones I caught this season. Hope you found that useful. And um, um, I try to do this every season, and um, we actually do this uh, live on Rabbit. So. Up over on uh, the Discord, over on geekarchaeology.com, and I post a link in there where we all sit down and watch every season, all the new anime of the season. So that's it for me. Thank you for watching. Again, hope you found this useful, and until next time, uh, hope you find some new awesome anime to watch.